Yeah, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry, I was indisposed for some a while, so that's why it's been a while. But let's continue. We'll surely finish within the stipulated time. So we want to look at um, how to use um, some financial models. You remember that this topic or this course is actually um, an intersection of the finance aspect as well as the supply chain um, aspect. So it's actually about applying some of the financial models in making decisions. Okay, so let's go to our objectives. So the first objective is that we should be able to distinguish among various financial models. You remember that we talk about some of the instruments of uh, supply chain finance, such as um, factoring or discount or reverse factoring, dynamic um, discounting, um, trade credit, and so on and so forth. You know, but they all apply the same form of financial models, which we'll be looking at, especially um, looking at the time value of money, because um, the, the whole process involves some kind of credit. You know, the bank giving you uh, money or giving paying the supplier on behalf of the customer, and it will take some time for the customer to also finally settle the bank. So that actually involves time value of money. So you should be able to um, compute the time value of money, that is finding the future value of an investment, and then finding the present value also of an investment. So some of the models that we know, we have the future value model, um, for a single payment, when you have just one lump sum of money that you are you intend to invest, and the assumptions underlying this one is that there are no additions and there are no um, withdrawals for the period under consideration. Okay, then we should also explain the future value and the present value concept for a single investment. Okay, so. That is what I initially said. So if you have, probably you need some money, you need some amount of money in let's say two years time. And assuming the interest rate is going to remain fixed over the next two years, how much would you have to put into an account today, which will be attracting that prevailing interest rate so that by the end of the second year, your money you get the balance. I mean, the balance you account to be equal to what you require. So in this case, we say that you want to find the present value of this future amount. And we have it for single payment, and we also have it for multiple payments. Okay, we'll look at that. And then understand annuities and the net present value concept. So annuities actually arises where we have equal multiple payments at equal intervals of time. So assuming you have you have set aside, you have decided to set aside a certain amount, let's say um, 50 Ghana from your salary every month, and then you invest into a fund. You see, so because the 50 cities you are setting aside, it doesn't vary because the intervals that you pay the money also does not vary, then we have what? Annuity. So we can have uh, where we pay the money in advance, that is to say that at the beginning of the period, and we can also pay at the end, which is at the end of the period. In actual fact, in Ghana, workers receive salaries in arrears. If you receive salary on January, um, or at the beginning of every month, sorry, let's say first of every month before you work, then that will be an advance. But we work before we are paid. So 
uh, the same applies to investment. So this period that I'm talking, we can have yearly, we can have quarterly, we can have semi-annually, we can have monthly, and so on and so forth. So we'll get to know them. So basically we are dealing with what we refer to as sinking fund, where monies are being set aside. And then when you have contracted a loan and the repayment of the loan is not to be made by one bulk sum of money, but you have to make equal installments at regular intervals of time over a period. And that is a typical example of what we see in banks. When you take a loan from the bank, uh, an equal amount is deducted from your salary until you finish paying. So that one comes to also is an annuity, but it is a present value of all the payments you'll be making for the number of durations that you have to pay. And that we normally reflect, refer to as amortization. So we have ordinary annuity. And that is when you are paying the installment in arrears and so on. Okay. So finally, we we'll know how to use these models to solve some problems, analyze problems involving trade credits. When the buyer is giving some um, discount based on the time the buyer pays within the stipulated time, right? So we'll get to know that, okay. So first, future value and then present value and then annuities. So we, as I was saying, future value of an invest, investment is where you have just set money aside and invest in a fund at an interest rate. And then you want to know the value of this fund at a certain point in time. So assuming you have gotten 100,000 cities, which in our old currency is um, one, billion okay okay sorry i'm i'm teaching as so let me finish and call okay so sorry for that i think um, i had a call and because i'm using the internet when the call comes it will um the internet will go down, right? So I just have to. All right. So we're talking about future value. So I'm assuming that you have 100,000 cities mm -hmm. um, in old currency. That would be 1 billion cities. And you want to put this money into an account for, let's say, five years. You see, so when this money is, an account is open and then you deposit this money, you are not going to add anything to this money. And you are also not going to withdraw anything from this money. So it will be like it will be in the account for the duration, that, let's say five years. And assuming the interest rate is 20% per annum. So how much will be your balance in your account at the end of the five year? So that is finding the future value of a single bulk sum of investment. Right? We also have the cases where you are not using this huge sum of money, but you want to just set aside equal sums of money at equal intervals of time over a period. So assuming every year you want to set aside, let's say 10,000 cities, you see? So every year, it means that by the end of the fifth year, you would have paid 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, five times. So what will be the future value of all these multiple payments that you make? You see, so that comes under what we call sinking fund. And as I said earlier on, we can have sinking fund in arrears. That is when you are making the payment at the end of the period. Assuming you want to make payments at the end of every month. That is an arrears. At the end of every quarter is an arrears. At the end of every four months is an arrears. At the end of every six months or semi-annual is an in arrears. And then every year you want to pay on 31st Zema every year. That is also what in arrears. But if you want to pay at the beginning of every month or every period, right? At the beginning of every period, 
So first of every month, that is in advance. First of every quarter is also in advance. Okay? So first of every six months is also in advance. You see, and then first of every year is also in advance. So that is the two um, forms of sinking fund models we have. All right. So you can find the future value of these installments or payment that you'll be making to the fund. Probably you are setting aside this money in order to raise some capital for a purpose. There are several reasons why people set money aside. A company may be doing this probably for an, an expansion project, you see, or for the establishment of a new production line, you see, and so on and so forth. Then we also have present value of a future amount. So net present value concept that applies to um, determining the present value of a future amount. So in that case, we also have the present value of one bulk sum of payment. That is, you, you want to know the current value. That is the principal of a future amount. Mm -hmm. So in five years time, you'll be needing, let's say, 100,000 cities for a project. But you want to invest towards that amount. So you want to find out how much you must invest into an account today. So definitely the present value is less than the future value, you see. Okay, so you want to find out how much you'll be investing into an account today so that it will be attracting some interest, you see. So here the assumption also applies. We do not add anything to it and then we do not subtract anything from it. Now, the moment some money is added along the line, then it does not fall under single sum of payment. Then it changes to what we call multiple payments. But then we also have where we do not have um, the same um, kind of payment under the multiple payment. You see, so that is also an annuity, but we don't have the same amount being paid. All right. So that is what we call the net present value. And then when you are making loans, payment of loans, equal payment of loans, where each payment that you make, it involves the interest and the principal, then that becomes amortization. Okay, so let's move on. Now, like I was saying, finding the future value of an investment. So one lump sum of investment. So the formula is simple right um this formula was derived okay but for your case you only need to apply it so fv stands for the future value and this is equal to p into bracket one plus r all raised to n so where your p is the principal you see or the amount that you are investing into the account and then your r represents the nominal rate of interest. Now, R is always stated on as per annum. You see, so if the interest rate is compounded a number of times within the year, then this nominal rate of interest will no longer be effective hmm, to apply in the year. It means we need to calculate what you call the effective annual interest rate. Okay. And then the duration is for N. The duration of investment is also expressed in years. You see, so some of the investments, the computation of interest is done a number of times within the year. So we say that the frequency of compounding, you see, so for example, we calculate the interest every year, uh, every month. You see, so in that case, the frequency of compounding, we denote the frequency of compounding by F. So that will be F will be equal to 12 because there are 12 months in the year. Now, if we compute the interest um, quarterly, how many quarters do we have in a year? It's four. So F will be four. If we compute the interest semi-annually, then 
because there are only two six months within the year, we'll compute the interest twice. So F will be two, you see, and so on. If we say that the interest compounded um, every four months, then there are four, three, four months within the year, you see, three, four months within the year. So F will be three. So whenever you are told that the interest is compounded a number of times within the year, in which case, where that number of times can be, it can be semi-annually, it can be quarterly, it can be monthly, and so on. Then you must introduce your F into the formula. In that case, you are going to just divide the rate of interest by the frequency of compounding. So you can see that in this formula, we say now F is equal to P into bracket, one plus R over F. You see, the rate, the nominal rate of interest divided by the uh, frequency of compounding. Multiply by NF, sorry, raised to NF. You see, when where NF stands for the number of times the, the interest will be compounded within the period. Now, take note that here, we are basically talking about compound interest. There are two forms of interest. We have simple interest, where with the simple interest, we compute the interest irrespective of the duration. You see, the same interest is computed irrespective of the duration of the investment. For example, if you have invested 50,000 for five years at 10% per annum, at the end of the first year, the interest will be 10% multiplied by 50,000. At the end of the second year, the interest will be 10% multiplied by 50,000. At the end of the third year, the interest will be 10% multiplied by 50,000. At the end of the fourth year, the interest will be 10% multiplied by 50,000, and so on. And that is for simple interest. So you can see that to calculate the simple interest of 10% on 50,000 for five years, it will just give you what? Um, 5,000. You see, so 10% of 50,000, 5,000. But when you look at business, you see, when we are doing business, assuming you are going to borrow um, this 50,000 for five years, and here the money is going to be with you for the five year, five year period. So you pay the interest and the principal at the end of the fifth year. Now, under normal business condition, you see, the first year, how much interest are you owing? is 10% by 50,000, and that will be 5,000, right? This 5,000, and that in strict business terms, this 5,000 must be paid to where you borrow the money from. That is, the one who lend you the money must earn that return of 5,000 at the end of the first year. But the, the 50,000 is still with you in addition to the interest that you have earned. And you are now using the 5,000 in addition to the 50,000. So under normal business terms, this 5,000 must also be considered as well, an additional principal. So you can see that with compound interest, we do not compute the interest on the original principal, just as we have done with the simple interest. No. but the principal changes at the beginning of every year. So if it is a compound interest for the five years, at the end of the first year, your interest will be 10% of 50,000, and that will be 5,000. At the end of the second year, your principal is no longer 50,000. Your principal is now 55,000. So the interest will now be 5,500. You see, 10% of 55,000, so 5,500. At the end of the third year, or at the beginning of the third year, your principal is no longer 5,000, uh, 55,000. It's now um, 55,000 plus 5,500, you see? So it will be somewhere 60,500 or so. And uh, it's, it's going to be computed on that amount. You see, so, that is what actually happens in business without any further statement in the terms of the agreement it is compound interest so take note okay so back to this model 
So we are saying that if the rate of interest is compounded a number of times within the year, you see, so we say it's compounded semi-annually. What it means is that because we have two semi-annuals in the year, F will be what, two. So you divide the nominal rate by the frequency of compounding, and you also multiply the duration by the frequency of compounding, and that will give you the NF. You see, because if, for example, um, the investment is for five years, right? And then the um, interest is compounded semi-annually. So that is twice a year. So by the end of the fifth year, how many times would interest have been compounded? It would have been 10 times because N is five. That's the duration. N is five. And F is two. You see, so five by two, 10. And that is true. Because if we have two semi-annuals in a year, then how many semi-annuals would you have? Would, would you have in what, five years? That would be 10 semi-annuals, you see? Okay, so that is for the, what we call the effective annual interest rate. And that is where you have the rate being computed uh, in multiple times within the year, then the nominal rate of interest will no longer be effective for computing the interest on annual basis. So we need to uh, determine what we call the effective annual interest rate. All right. So here, uh, what we did and from the previous slide was to find the future value of a single amount. And here we are finding the present value of a future amount. So PV stands for the principal or the present value. Take note that always the principal is represented by the present value. And then R is the rate of interest, which is always expressed on per annum basis. N is the duration of the investment in years. And then FV is the future value of the investment. So to find the present value, just a matter of uh, rearranging the formula to make uh, pr the principal the subject. So you can see that from our previous formula, then P will be equal to um, the future value over one plus r raised to n. And this is the same as the future value multiplied by one plus r raised to n. That is, if you want the denominator to multiply the, the numerator, then the index will just change to negative. This from the law of indices. You know that uh, one over a is the same as a raised to negative one. Uh, one over two is the same as two raised to negative one. One over a squared is the same as a raised to negative two and so on. Okay, so this formula applies when finding the present value of one lump sum, of one lump sum, right? When the interest is compounded a number of times within the year, we have PV is equal to FV over one plus R over F, just as we did in the future value example. It's the same thing that is applying here. So we have to just divide the rate by the frequency. Right, and then you multiply the duration also by the frequency. That is when the interest is compounded a number of times within the year. Okay. Now, I indicated that if the interest is compounded a number of times within the year, then the nominal rate of interest is no longer effective for computing the rate on annual basis. So what is effective is now the effective annual interest. That's why we say effective annual, you see? Effective annual interest rate. So here, a nominal annual rate of interest, R percent, used to compound interest once in a year does not give the same future value when it is used to compound interest multiple times in a year, you see? So in such a situation, we compute the effective annual interest rate given by IEFF. So IEFF just stands for effective annual interest rate. And this is given by one plus R over F or raised to F minus one. Take note that here is raised to F and not NF. So F is the frequency of compounding and then R is the nominal rate of interest. All right, so for example, if 
R, the nominal rate of interest is given as 20% per annum. You see, and the nominal rate is always stated on per annum basis. But it is compounded semi annually. Then the frequency of compounding, F, will be two, because there are two semi annuals in the year. You see, since there are two uh, six months in the year, so that R over F is 20% over two, which will be 10%. And 10% is what? 0 0.1. So when you substitute this into the formula, then you have IEFF is equal to 1 plus 0 0.1 all squared. Right? That is because it's raised to F, and F is 2. So we subtract 1 from the whole thing. So 1.1 squared is 1.21 minus 1. That would be 0 0.21. So the effective annual interest rate is 21%. What it means is that because the rate is compounded a number of times within the year, the 20% is no longer effective in computing the interest rate on annual basis. So what is effective is the 21%. Now take note that always your effective annual interest rate is higher than the nominal interest rate. You see, so here, and then the, the higher the frequency of compounding, the higher the rate of interest. So this one, for example, the frequency of compounding was two because it's on semi-annual basis. If assuming that the frequency of compounding is, let's say, on a uh, quarter, which it will be uh, four, because there are four quarters in a year. If F is four, then the, uh, effective annual interest rate will be higher than 21%, right? So the higher the frequency of compounding, the higher the returns. You see, that's why most of these, uh, uh, let's say the microfinance companies, if you go in for a loan, you see, they'll tell you that it's 5% per annum, uh, per month. That is quite expensive. You see, because if it is 5% per month, five times 12 is what, six days. So in ineffectively, you are paying 60% on the loan, you see, per run, which is what? Quite expensive. So these days you see people, uh, and I do get some of these messages that we are offering loan at one point something percent and, and so on, you see, 1% or 1.05%. When you multiply by 12, just about, let's say, 13% per run. And you see that it's quite cheap, but, I am not interested in those things, so I don't follow up, right? Okay, so let's look at an example here. He said that your company has decided to set up a fund, and this fund is purposely for payments made to its suppliers for purchases of merchandise mm, with an initial payment of 200,000 cities, right? Which is compounded six monthly over a five year period at 24% per annum. You see, so let's say the company just want to set up a fund and the purpose of this fund is to use it to pay supplies. You see, because it has been buying merchandise or stocks or inventory or any other form of uh, goods from the supplier. You see, so we just want to set up this fund and use it to be paying supply, but the fund is going to be remain untouched for five years, you see. But the rate of interest is at 24% per annum. And this is compounded semi-annual, you see. Every six months, we compute the interest on the investment. So one, calculate the size of the fund at the end of the five years. So what will be the size of your investment? So take note that if your rate is 20%, 24% uh, per annum, and that is the nominal rate of interest, but this rate is compounded every six months. Then you cannot use the 24% every six months. You have to divide it by what? Two. So your frequency of compounding will be two. So I think it means that every six months we are going to use 12%. You see? So let's look at the, the solution. You, de you demonstrate in tabular form the growth of the fund. This one is just to show. Um, in a practical form, how the fund is growing, right? You present it in a tabular form, we we'll look at that. And then you determine the effective annual interest rate, okay. 
So this is the solution. Now, P, the principal, is 200,000. Then R, which is the rate of interest, is 24% per annum. And then your frequency of compounding is 2. Your duration, which is N, is 5. You see? Now, because you have been told that the rate of interest is compounded twice in a year, that comes under multiple compounding. So here, you're going to divide R by F. So that will be 24 over 2, which will be 12%. And that will give you 0 0.12. And then you have to multiply the duration also by the frequency. So the duration is 5 years. And the frequency is 2. So 5 by 2, that will be 10. You see, that suggests that if I'm investing an amount for 5 years, and my interest is compounded every six months. By the end of the tenth, uh, the fifth year, how many times will the interest have been compounded? And that will be 10, because you have two six months in a year. So five years, you have 10 six, uh, 10 six months, right? So just substitute into the formula, and the future value gave us 621169.64. So for example, if you want to find out the total interest, the future value is just 621,169.64. So just subtract the principal amount from this uh, figure. And then the difference will give you the um, interest that has been earned on the investment. So you can see that if you subtract 200,000 from this figure, you're going to get about 400,000 plus. And that has been the interest on the loan. Again, in the tabular form, which we have it, so you can see that here, I've written period. It's not yearly basis, it's six monthly. So you can even put into brackets six monthly. So from one, uh, six month, one, one stands for the first six months, two stands for the second six months, the third six months, the fourth six months, up to the all, the tenth six months. So we have um, 10 six months within five years. So this is the principal amount, 200,000. So at the end of the first six months, we find 12% of the 200,000, and that will be 24,000 cities. So this is the interest that will be earned on the 200,000 cities for the first six months. So at the end of the first six months, the balance in the account will be 224,000 cities. This will be the opening balance beginning the next six months, you see? So at the end of the second six months, we'll compute 12% on the 242,000 to give us 26,880. So when you add it to the 224, the balance we account will now be 250,880. Beginning third year, your balance is 250,880. You find 12%, that will be 30, and so on. So you do it up to the 10th year. And the final figure that you should get here must tally with this. But sometimes there will be some variations because um, you might not be using all the decimal places. You see, so some decimal um, differences will cause slight difference, but at least the difference should be should not be significant. Yeah. Okay. Then we are asked to compute the effective annual interest rate. So here, IEFF will just be one plus the 12%, which is 0 0.12 all square, and then you subtract one, and will give us 25.44%. So you see that the effective annual interest rate is higher than the nominal interest rate, okay. So, but this is just for one single bulk sum of money being deposited into an account for a period, you see, and we forget about it until um, the five years. Okay, so now let's look at annuities and what we have been using, what we call the discounted cash flows. So net present value, NPV, is an investment in the, an investment with the difference between its market value and what, its cost. You see, so it just like um, you want to determine whether, let's say, something is profitable or is viable. You know the cash flows that is associated with, let's say, that particular project. So let's say it's a five-year project. 
you know the cash flows that will be generated in year one cash flows that will be generated in year two and so on up to year five but you see because these cash flows are not going to be received now but in the years ahead of us that's why we have to discount them so given an interest rate we discount all the cash flows to their present value as if uh, to determine their value as we we know it today you see so when you sum up everything that will give you your present value now the project is also costing us we are investing huge amount into the project and we normally denote that amount by um, C suspect O. Oh, that is what we call the initial capital outlay. So when we subtract, you see, we we discount all the future cash flows and we sum up, and then we subtract the initial capital outlay from it, and it doesn't give us a positive value. Then we don't see the project as what well, a viable one. That is the basis for MPV. Okay, but we are not here going to compare projects investment because this is just for supply chain finance. We only have to know this concept in applying it in the trade credit. All right, so we're saying that net present value of an investment is the difference between its market value and its cost. So the market value is actually the PV that we have or sum up, right? The PVs that we have computed for the future all the future cash flows and we have sum up and then the cost is what we are investing in the project or what the project is costing us the money that is required for the project to come into um, life now when equal payment installments and uh, we say equal payments or when equal installments are made at regular intervals of time for example on monthly or it can be three monthly or it can be yearly Mm -hmm. then we call it what annuities in the same manner if the stream of cash flows for n years is given by let's say a1 a2 a3 dot dot up to an right then the present value of pv of each cash flows using a discount rate of r percent is given by that so it is just a summation of all the present value we have done the present value formula in our previous and session so just a1 over 1 plus r raised to um, 1 plus a2 so for the second um, year you see it will be the cash flows for the second year over 1 plus r raised to 2 a3 that's for the third year up to the nth year a n so it gives us this summation so that mpv is equal to the summation which will be the pv minus the co where co is the cost of the investment okay but what we want to understand here is just two models how to apply sinking fund and then amortization so um, a company can decide to be setting equal sums of money at equal intervals of time and this investment is make it is made I mean, in the interest of um, regular purchases with a supplier, you see, or where a bank has also paid um, the suppliers an amount, because let's say um, the duration of the trade credit will be, let's say, 12 months. But the supplier also want the money. So you want the money within 30 days. In this case, we have what we call the incremental rate, right? the bank will calculate the incremental rate for example if the the annual interest rate is let's say 18 percent and um, the supplier wants the money within 30 days then we all, we normally assume a certain number of uh, working days within the year so if let's say there's 360 working days within the year then you're going to divide the 18 percent by 360 and then you multiply by the 30 days. And that will give us about 1.5%. So it, in this case, the bank is going to calculate 1.5% of the total amount. And then we will we'll subtract it. The bank will take that one as a discount and pay the balance to the um, supplier. You see, that is one way of um, financing of the supply chain, which we have various models, mm, dynamic discounting, 
um, reverse factory and so on. Okay, so let's go on. Multiple payments um, at regular intervals into a fund. So this is a sinking fund. Sinking fund is just like an investment you are making. See, so you are making payment, which is not single uh, once, once and for all, but you are making uh, multiple payments, you see, into a fund. So here, we have where you make the payment at the end of the period that you are paying. If you are paying on an annual basis, and you decide to pay the money into the fund on every 31st December, that is in arrears. But if you decide to pay the money on annual basis, and you pay on every uh, beginning of every every year, that is 1st January, that is what, in advance. So those are the two models. You can see that the only difference between the two models is that with the advanced one, um, the whole thing is multiplied by, um, is multiplied by um, one plus r, one plus r. So is s equal to a uh, into into bracket one plus r all raised to n minus one over r for if your your payment is in arrears, and where payments are made in advance then you multiply the same thing by one plus r again. So where s, this s stands for what? The sinking fund. So that is the sum, the sum of all the future payments you'll be making, you see. For example, first year, you are paid five, uh, let's say 5,000 first year. And let's say you are making the uh, investment for five years. So the first year, if you are making payment at the beginning of every year, the first year will attract the full five-year period. You see, but if you are making your payment at the end of every year, then the, the first installment will not attract anything for the first year. Because the first year before you make that payment, the year would have end, assuming you are paying on every 31st December. You see, so by that time, you have ended the year on 31st December before you go and pay. So it will, it will start attracting interest rather from the second year. And again, it will not attract any interest for the last year because you only go and add that money to your balance. But if you are making payment in advance, then you are making payment on, on the first of every year. So the, the, the first deposit you make will stay in the account for the whole year, you see? So by the time we get to the third is a to attract interest for the first year. And the installment that you also make for the last year will also attract what? Interest. So in actual fact, when you are making payment in advance, you get higher returns than when you are making payments in areas. This is a simple logic because um, the longer the money stays in account, the, the higher the interest, right? So these are the two models for sinking fund. Okay, let's look at amortization. Again, here it's also about what? Equal installment. So you have taken a loan. You see here A is the sum of the present value of all the equal installments made by the customer or the borrower. You see, so you you are making, for example, you have taken 10,000 from the bank. For you, all you know, the bank is deducting, let's say, um, you have taken 10,000, let's say the bank is deducting um, 1,200, you see, 1,200 from your, from your salary every, every month. And assuming you are paying this for 24 months, two years, you see, so you are paying 1,200, 1,200, 1,200 constant for 24 months. So by the end of the 24 months, you would have paid in total, in total, you would have paid 1,200 by 24. You see, you would have paid 28,200. But how much did you take? You took only 10,000. So when you subtract the 10,000 from it, you see, the balance is what? 18,800. So the 18,800 is the interest you have paid on the loan. You see, but that is even not what I'm interested in. It's the equal installment that you are making in order to finish paying the loan. So in actual fact, amortization simply means to kill. And that is one of the cheapest way of loan repayment. 
assuming you have taken 10,000 for two years, but you are not going to make any payment, the money is going to be with you to the end of the second year. Then you go and pay the principal plus the interest. That would be, even if you are not fortunate by that time, you, you may not have money to pay. You see, that is the essence of paying, uh, making repayment of loan by installment, because that is quite cheaper. You see, so when we have that time and you have that situation, because the loan is being repaid by making equal installments, that is why we call it amortization. That, that also comes under our annuity. And the formula applies. This formula is the same. Um, a, in fact, this formula is for the arrears. If it is in advance, then it should be multiplied by one plus R again. But under amortization, normally we do not have advance payments, right? Uh, not that we don't have, but it does not apply. What it means is that if you are making payments in advance, then the very time that the money is credited into your account, that same period, the installment must begin. So they will also be that something. And then uh, to show that you are, you are paying advance, okay. So A is the sum of the present values of all the equal installments made by the customer. R, the prevailing interest rate, that's the nominal interest rate, assuming constant over a period, right? N is the duration of, of the loan in years. And then the principal amount is the P. So this is a principal. And the small a is the installment that you are making. Remember that that small a is also the payment you'll be making in the sinking fund model. Okay, so here, uh, with the amortization model and then the sinking fund model, and uh, we normally also have tables. <clears throat> there are tables that um, these uh, what we call the annuity factor. When you compute whatever is in this square bracket, that's what we call the annuity factor. So there are tables that these annuity factors have been computed already. So we can just refer to it. If for example, um, the interest rate is 20% and the duration is 10 years, then the percentages are written across, mm -hmm, across the table on top. And then on the first column, the duration is there from year one, year two, year three. So you only read, look for 10 and the column, and then you read it under 20. So 10 under 20, and then the figure will be there, the factor will be there. So you, you just pick it straight away. If you don't mind, you can calculate it using the formula. Okay, so that is the two forms of annuities that we have. That is where you are investing. And in that case, you set some money aside or where you are repaying a loan. Okay. So let's look at an example here. You said that a customer made payment of 7,200 CDs a month hmm, uh, to, to his bankers. So let me, I think the A shouldn't be there. Uh, he made this amount to his bankers over an eight month period. So the customer pay this money every month for eight months in order to settle a loan offered to a supplier for goods, goods that has been supplied. So what it means is that the supplier supply goods to this customer, but the customer was unable to pay the supplier. You see, so the money was actually paid to the, by the customer's bankers to the supplier and the customer must repay the bank. But then in repaying the bank, he is to make uh, eight equal monthly installments of 7,200 CDs, you see? Okay, so the supplier who wants 30, who wants, he wants 30 days acceleration of payment set, set the rate of interest to 24% per annum, okay, compounded monthly, and assume 360 working days in a year, okay. So you see the, the rate of interest between the supplier and the buyer was 24% per annum. But this 24% rate is compounded what? Monthly. So what it means is that we're going to divide the 24% by 12 because there are 12 months in a year. 
and then we'll use two percent every month okay so the first question says that how much was paid to the supplier and then what was the incremental discount charge by the bank is this so because the bank you the supplier you want your money early you see because um, I think the duration is eight months, but the supplier wants it within 30 days. You see, so the bank will discount it, will, will subtract a discount from your, your money. Okay, so we, we have been asked to compute for that discount, that incremental discount. Okay. And then what is the total interest paid by the customer? Okay, and what is the effective on interest rate? So let's look at the solution. Let's look at the solution. Okay, so this requires determining the sum of the present value of all the equal payments. See, um, the customer is paying 7,200, 7,200, 7,200 for eight times. So for, for the eight months. So you have to find the present value of all these payments, right? And that will be equal to what the amount that was due to the supplier, less the incremental discount by the bank. So the equal installment is A, which is 7,200. Rate of interest R is 24%. Then F is 12%. We introduce the F because there is multiple compounding. And then N is what? 8 over 12. You see, N is always quoted in years. Are you okay? But here, the duration is not up to one year. It's eight months. You see, so it will be, if you want to express it in years, that would be 8 over 12 years. You see, so here, um, you just write 8 over 12 years. So Y E A R is okay. My goodness. Okay, let me just make it Y R S. Okay. All right. Oh. Uh, so this is eight over twelve years. Yeah. Eight over twelve years. All right. So R over 12 will be 24% over 12. That will be 2%, and that is 0 0.02. And then remember that we have to multiply the duration, which is 8 over 12 years, by the frequency of compounding, which is 12, you see? So that will be 8 over 12 times. So that will give us 8. What does that mean? The rate is compounded monthly. So for eight months, how many times would the rate have been compounded? Eight. So that makes sense. So you just substitute these values into your model. PV is equal to A into bracket one plus R all raised to N minus one. Right? Remember that the minus one is not the N, it's not affecting the N, it's affecting all the one plus R raised to N. And then all over R into bracket one plus R or is two. So when you substitute, you will get 52,743.46. So this is the actual price that the customer was to pay the supplier, uh, let's say today. But if the, the customer is unable to pay this money and he has to pay it in, in the eighth month, that is eight months' time. Then when you multiply the 7,200 by eight, what do you get? Um, 7,200 by eight, that will give us, um, okay, let me point, 7,200 by eight, you see, 57,600, you see. But because he's going to pay it in, eight months time that's why to go to the 57,800 because of our time value of money so um the money the incremental discount to is because um we are assuming 360 working days and then the the sup, uh, supplier also want the money within 30 days so we divide the 24 percent by 360 and then multiply by the 30 so that'll give us two percent so the bank 
will take a discount of 2% from this figure. You see, so 0 0.02 multiplied by 52,743. So this is the money that the bank will do that. Then that's 1,054.89. And the money that will be paid to the customer will be the difference. So the bank will deduct the 1,054 from the 52,000. So that will be 51,688, right? If you go and buy fixed deposit or T-bill and then it's not matured, but you want your money, then you won't get the full amount. And it will be discounted. And that is exactly what you are doing here. So increment discount charge by the bank is 10, that is 1054, so 1054.89 um, cities. What is the total interest paid on the loan? Just multiply what you are paying every month and uh, by the duration. So 7.7200 7, by eight, and then you subtract the principal from it, you see. So the interest paid on the loan is what, 4,856. Point. That makes sense. And the effective annual interest rate is 26.82. And as I said, always the effective annual interest rate is higher than the nominal interest rate. Okay, so let's see whether we have anything further. Okay, so now, based on what you have done, you have to do this assignment and um, submit um i'll show you a email account um the email account let me write it here okay let me come down so this is the first assignment um a supplier supplied a customer with goods valued at fifty thousand cities on first january 2020 uh, on credit terms the buyer the buying organization says the annual rate charged for borrowing by the supplier, that is the annualized percentage rate, APR, at 20%, compounded monthly. And the supplier wants to be paid 30 days earlier, that is 30 days acceleration of payment than the original net due date. Now, however, in order for the supplier to raise capital to run the business, he has agreed to the he has agreed to be paid by the customer's bankers while the customer in turn pays the bank on, on the due date. To repay the bank on October 31, 2020, um, the customer has decided to set aside equal sums of money and invest in a fund, which earns 24% per annum rate of interest compounded monthly in advance. Okay, so one, what is the incremental discount charge by the bank? Two, how much will the buyer pay the bank on June 30, 2023? Determine the equal installment the customer has to make into the fund. And then four, prepare a sinking fund schedule. And then five, what will be the equal installments when the buyer makes payments in arrears? And then six, construct a sinking fund schedule. Okay. The second one is ABC Incorporation purchases merchandise from a company that gives um, it gives size terms of um, two, that is two net 50. That is, if the customer pays within 15 days, this is what it means. The two stroke 15 just means that if you're able to pay within 15 days, you get a, a, a discount of 2%. Meanwhile, the, the time within which the customer must pay, must pay the money is within 40 days. So that's why you have the net 40. But if he's able to pay within 15 days, he will get a discount of 2%. Okay. So ABC has gross purchase of um, 819,388 CDs per year. Now, what is the maximum amount of costly trade credit ABC could get, assuming it, it abides by the supplier's credit terms. Okay, so assuming a 365 day uh, working days in a year. And then the second one is that a firm is offered trade discount terms of two, 
stroke eight. What it means is that if the customer is able to pay within eight days, you get a discount of two, two percent. So, but then the duration is forty-five days, within which the um, the money must be paid. Okay. So the firm does not take the discount and it pays after fifty-eight days. Oh, okay. You see. So what is the effective annual cost of not taking this discount? Assuming a three sixty-five day a year. Okay, so this one, um, you should submit the due date. The due date should be, um, I'm giving this uh, tonight. So the due date today is Sunday. Okay, so it should be Wednesday, right? I'm just trying to be flexible. Wednesday. Today is um, today is third or second, third, fourth Monday, fifth Tuesday, six. Okay, so Wednesday, six, uh, six May, twenty twenty, at um, six p.m. All right, so. Um, submit to submit to uh, UGBS two zero eight at gmail.com. I've written tonight two zero two zero eight right at gmail gmail dot com. So you submit to UGBS two zero eight at gmail dot com. Make sure you write your ID. It's ID that I'm interested. No name. Okay. So in our next lecture, we'll look at the forms of financial statements. The three financial statements: okay. the income statement, the um, balance sheet, and then the statement of cash flows. Okay. So have a good day. We'll end here.